Thank you, worship team, for leading us into that wonderful time of worshiping the Lord, praising Him together. And thank all of you who are serving this morning, either as AV or hospitality or ushers or children ministry. Thank you all for serving together. We often tell the congregation that in this church here, no one can do church alone. We do it together. And with all the helps, we are so grateful that we are able to honor God through our service and able to serve each other. Um, again, to welcome all of you to the worship, uh, either indoor or outdoor or online. Uh, let's join our hearts together uh, and to uh, just hear God's word and uh, respond to God together. Um, this morning, I want to share with you the voice in the wilderness. And many of you are aware that John the Baptist is the voice in the wilderness. Uh, he's the first witness the Apostle John calls to testify for Jesus so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. And you remember, that's the purpose of John writing the Gospel of John in John chapter 20, verse 31. And as a trustworthy witness, John the Baptist reinforces the identity of Jesus and substantiates the claim that Jesus is the Messiah by the Apostle John. And his appearance, of course, has caused a stir among the people. He was a special figure. And in verses 8 to 1 to 18, in the last two sermons, you remember, the whole section, John could have used the whole section to introduce Jesus as the Word, as God, as the Creator, who revealed Himself to us by becoming flesh and dwell among us. But if you read carefully, the apostle can wait to introduce John as the first witness by interjecting some teachings about John the Baptist within that 18 verses from the very beginning. It's, he can't wait. So look at verses 6 to 8. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Now he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The first interjection. And before he goes on for a, a few verses about Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the true light, again in verse 15, he injected his thought again on John the Baptist. Verse 15 says, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And then he will go on and say something else about Jesus the Messiah in that whole section, beginning in verse 1 all the way to 18. He cuts the flow, he interrupts the floor, so that he can introduce John the Baptist. There's an urgency in calling John the Baptist to come forward and be the first witness of the Messiah. Because the Apostle John wants many, many more people to know that Jesus is a true light, that those who believe in His name will become children of God. There will be other witnesses that he will call as the Apostle John continues to write 21 chapters of, John, of the Gospel of John. God the Father will testify Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Old Testament Scriptures. Jesus' work itself will also testify Him to be the Messiah, and Jesus' disciples, of course. They will testify that this is truly the Son of God. But John is the first one. John the Baptist is the first one. And verses 6 to 8 reminds us that, first of all, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was a man. In contrast to the Word, Jesus, who was God. He was only a man, and his name was John. And the word John means gift of God, or a God is gracious. It's a beautiful name, John. God is gracious. And it reminds us that he was sent from God. That's as popular as John the Baptist was during that time. He didn't have the authority to proclaim, to testify, except given by God, commissioned by God, and his authority was delegated by God. So as popular as he was, he was not the main figure. Jesus is the main figure. And he bore witness about the light. 
That's the purpose of His coming. He bear witness about the light. That's the first time the word witness appears in this section here. And it appears three times. He came as a witness. So He bear witness about the light and all my believe through Him, and He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. You know, in the original language, the word witness means martyr. That matureo in Greek is the English word martyr, which means someone who, has, who is willing to die for the faith. And applying to be a witness as the matureo, as the martyr, it means someone who has seen or heard something so convicting, so true and so real that he's willing to pay with his life just to testify, just to proclaim, just to talk about that. And that's a witness. So today when we say, I am a witness of Jesus, I'm witnessing for Jesus, you're saying that I'm, I'm going to do it as much as I can, as far as I can, even if it means to, to pay with the price of my life. I'm so convicted by what I have seen and heard and experienced through this person, Jesus Christ. That's what, what we mean by when you are a witness of Jesus Christ. And it clearly states that his purpose was that all might believe Jesus through him. So he, he's a conduit. He's a channel of blessing that points other people to Jesus. Now, don't miss the underlying message here. It's clearly stated in verse 8 that he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. John the Baptist is not the light. He's not the Messiah, but he bear witness about the light, the Messiah. So he's reminding you and me that Jesus is central. I am not. I'm not the focus. Don't let spotlight shine on me, but divert that to Jesus, because my whole intention of witnessing is to witness for Jesus, concerning Jesus. And secondly, look at verse 15. He reminds us that this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, I, I am the forerunner, so I'm telling you, but he who comes after me ranks before me. He's my boss. He's much higher than me because he was before me. He existed before me. And you are reminded through the preaching of Pastor Hanley in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. He is God. That's what John the Baptist is saying. He came, I came before him, but he ranks higher because he existed before me. He, he is God. So I'm trying to, to testify that Jesus is superior. Jesus reigns supreme in my life and in your life, and I'm testifying for him as he comes on a stage. And once he's on a stage, then I'll just fade away. I'll go away. I'm only a forerunner. I'm a witness. So clearly, as a witness, John's main role is to glorify and identify Jesus so that people may believe him that he is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. You see, in his hastiness, he can't resist the temptation. He can't resist the urge to inject John the Baptist from the very beginning as he introduced Jesus the Messiah. But only bits and pieces there. Then, second point, he begins to talk about John, uh, John the Baptist begins to reveal his own identity first, later on, Jesus' identity. That's what he's called to be. Look at verses 19 to 28. The whole section about John the Baptist begins with John the Baptist revealed his own identity. Let me read to you 19 to 20, and you can follow along with the Bible here. And this is a testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? You, you need to give an answer. Uh, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. 
make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. Then they asked him, then, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of those sandals, I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Before John the Baptist baptized for Jesus, he began to reveal his own identity. You see, the, the Jewish council sent an official delegation comprising priests and Levites and, and Pharisees. Verse 24 says, Pharisees joined them as well to investigate John the Baptist. Uh, why, why, why are they being part of the delegations? For the priests, they are concerned about the matter about theological authorities, about heresies. It's, it's John the Baptist's heresy. The Levites, the Levites are concerned about the, the ritual and the service of the temple. Okay? No disruption for sacrifice and, and, and all that thing. Make sure that the proper worship and sacrifices can, can go on in the temple. So is John the Baptist disrupting that? What about the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees are concerned about the strict interpretation of the law. They want to be accurate. They want to do it right to the letter of the word. And they came together to ask about and inquire about John the Baptist. You see, John the Baptist doesn't fit their mode of operation. The whole mode of operation has to happen within the temple, within the sacrificial system within the cleansing and within all the, all the laws that they have imposed on the people. But John the Baptist was in the wilderness and crying out in this voice and calling people to repentance. He doesn't belong to us. Who is he? Who authorized you to do that? On whose name could you do all this stuff? He was very influential. He attracted a lot of people. He has a large following. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 18, there was a man called Apollos, a very gifted preacher, and he only understood the baptism of John, a follower of John the Baptist, a great preacher, until Aquila and Priscilla explained the way of God more accurately. And if you remember in Acts chapter 19, the next chapter, in the first seven verses, there were 12 disciples of John the Baptist. They only understood John, John's baptism, which is the baptism of repentance. And when Paul saw them in the city of Ephesus, he told them that they need to believe in Jesus, who will baptize them with the Holy Spirit, which they did for the forgiveness of sins. So when this delegation came to confront John the Baptist, and the Bible says John the Baptist gave a truthful confession in verse 20. He confessed, did not deny, but confessed. This expression is basically saying that I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He will not deny, and he will not add on anything on who he is. First of all, he said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the anointed one. People have very, a very different conception about who is the Messiah, even among the Jews. Some will look at a king, kingly figure on the throne of the Davidic dynasty. Others will look at someone sent from God who will bring justice and righteousness to the society. And especially popular was the view that the Messiah will come as a political Messiah and bring justice and deliver and, and, and give us freedom from the bondage of the Roman Empire because the Jews were under the Roman Empire's rule. And they were hoping for this political Messiah to come along. He said, I am not that person. And he said, I'm not Elijah either. And they remember in Malachi, 
the prophet Malachi prophesies, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord's coming, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the hearts of children to the father, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. So John, are you that person who can turn the heart of the children to the father and the fathers to the children and reunite a family together before the judgment comes upon our land? John said, I'm not. Now, if you remember Luke's chapter 1, that talks about the birth of John the Baptist. In verse 17, it reminds us that John the Baptist will be born, and he will come, and he will have the spirit and power of Elijah. So his ministry may be similar to Elijah, but he is not Elijah. And thirdly, he says, I am not the prophet the prophet. And, and, and the Jews popul Jewish population, they all understand, they were familiar with Old Testament scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, which is, the Lord your God, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Who is that prophet? You know, God has raised many prophets in the history of the Israel's, Israelites' history. But the prophecy is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, a prophet like Moses. He said, I'm none of that. Then, of course, they ask him, who are you? We need to give an accountability. We need to report back to the council. Who are you? Tell us from your own lips. And John was honest and transparent. As he said in verse 20, he confessed, did not deny. He confessed. He said, I am a voice. I am a voice. In verse 23, quoting the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I am only a voice. I am not even a prophet, a person. That's not important. He prepares the way of the Lord by calling people to repent and to change their attitude in anticipation of meeting Jesus. John the Baptist was a voice for God, but Jesus was the Word of God. He's a voice without a face. It could be a voice of a prophet. Maybe that's his role. A voice of a spokesperson for Jesus. Can be a witness, a voice of a witness for Jesus. But the speaker is insignificant. That's why he said, I'm a voice. Don't put my face up there. Don't put my name up there. I am not important. My voice is important. I'm preparing you to receive the Messiah and I will fade out from the spotlight and the spotlight should shine on Jesus, the Messiah. I'm only a voice, so hear my voice, but don't remember me as a prophet, as a witness, as a person. I'm not important. I will fade out. He shall increase and I shall decrease. So as a forerunner, as a witness, his role is to awaken people to their need for God by pointing them to the Messiah, Jesus. And with that, in verses 25 to 28, they begin to question him and say, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophets? These three significant figures, authority figures in the history of of Israel, you are none of them, then who authorized you to even baptize people? To understand why they even asked the question, you need to understand the background. See, the Jews, they practice ritual cleansing, like cleaning of hands or feet and things like that. But only the Gentiles need to be baptized when they were converted to Judaism. And when a Gentile family is converted to Judaism, the males of the family, they underwent circumcision, all of them. But the, the whole members of 
the family, male or female, they were all baptized. So only the Gentiles turning to Judaism, they need to be baptized. The Jews, they don't need to. They don't see themselves needing for baptism. So they are questioning John the Baptist's authority in baptizing the Jews, which were the majority of his audience when he called people to repentance. And, and John was re re responding to them that I baptize you with water, but among you stands one you do not know. That's the Messiah. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. I am baptizing for the coming Messiah. I'm asked to baptize to prepare the hearts in repentance to receive forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ only. But they start opening their hearts and changing their attitude to be receptive to the coming of a Messiah. It is He who authorized me to give that baptism, to prepare the way. I'm called to prepare the way. And he's so majestic that John says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. The lowest possible job among the slaves. Even slaves have different jobs. But to wash the feet and to untie the sandals and to, and to wash that, that sandal, dusty sandal, that's the lowest of the lowest. And John says, I'm even lower. <laughs> I'm even lower than the slaves. I'm not even worthy to untie, to do those jobs. That's how, how high the view he has for the Messiah. You know, when you, when you listen to this section, have you ever wondered that the way the disciples of John the Baptist embraced him and followed him and refused to let go of his teaching by embracing what Jesus will offer them, the forgiveness of sins, and they were quite satisfied with just repentance through baptism. Is that some way similar to what we have today when we are stuck with some popular authors and popular speakers and popular figures, a celebrity? Now, let me get it right. The problems usually do not lie with those popular speakers and popular authors. They were, they were only doing their job, and, and they, they did so well, they excel in what they were called to do that we were benefited by it. And the problem is, it is the fans. The fans who follow those figures, who elevate them and promote them and idolize them and deify them to the level that those popular speakers and popular authors never intended. I believe most of them do not want that. They were just doing their job by serving the public. But the fans, the followings, can't help but keep elevating their figure. And could that be happening as well in your Christian walk, in your discipleship as you follow Jesus? See, the danger of pointing people to the Messiah is that people mistook you as the Messiah. That after a while, when you keep talking about God, you keep talking about Messiah, you keep talking about salvation, then people begin to see you as Messiah-like figure, as God-like figure. And you know what? You enjoy that, <laughs> and I enjoy that too. That when people affirm you, of course we are, we are all encouraged by those affirmations, but there is a line that you can't cross. And John the Baptist never crossed that. He truly understands his identity that I am not Christ, I am not Elijah, I am not the prophet, I am not important, but He, He is important. So follow Him. I point you to Jesus, but follow Jesus, don't follow me. I can bless you, I can encourage you, but go to Jesus and walk with Him. And for those who are serving, and for those who are actively doing things, and for, especially for those who are gifted, gifted in teaching, gifted in preaching, gifted in caring, gifted in many areas, sometimes the temptation is great that we become more like the Messiah while eclipsing the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. And finally, 
after he showed us his own identity, just to dispel any rumors and misunderstanding, John the Baptist testified about Jesus' identity. Verses 29 to 34. Let me read to you. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And now John the Baptist is doing his job as a witness. He testified Jesus' identity in three ways. First of all, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the title, Lamb of God, presented Jesus as a Lamb that God had provided as a substitute sacrifice for people's sin. It's like the lamb God provided for Abraham to substitute for Isaac as a sacrifice on the altar. It's like the Passover lamb whose blood painted on the doorpost will spare the firstborn of the household from being slaughtered. It's like a scapegoat that the high priest laid his hand on the head to symbolize the transferring of the guilt of the people to the animal and release the animal into the wilderness to proclaim the removal of the guilt from the people. It is like the lamb of Isaiah chapter 53, who was led to the slaughter for the sins of God's people. Lamb of God, Jesus is the lamb of God. He is the redeemer who offered himself to be the substitutional atonement for our sins. And John had not known that Jesus was the Messiah before God revealed to him in the later verses, even though they were relatives. And John learned who Jesus really was when he baptized Jesus, and he heard a voice from the heaven, this is my beloved son, which we will talk about later. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And you and I have witnessed in our days that there was a great effort, human effort, to try to erase sin from our lives. That's how common people deal with sin. Instead of coming to the Messiah for the forgiveness of sins, they find ways, ways that are politically correct, ways that will help them to mitigate the guilt the sleepless nights that they continue to wrestle within their hearts. We change legislation to make it legal. We redefine the meaning to make it legit. We laugh about that in the entertainment industry so that we can lessen the guilt. When you can laugh about an issue, you know, it's not an important matter anymore. We, we normalize it and popularize it to make it more acceptable. We threaten the opponent and to silence them. We erase it from the records and memory so that we don't have to talk about that anymore. We cancel it from social media so that there's no platform to propagate. We numb ourselves with substance abuse and other things. We occupy ourselves with business and loud music and other substitutes, pretending that they are not there. Those are human efforts of trying our best to eliminate, erase sin from being mentioned because you have to deal with the guilt when there is sin. The only thing that human refuse to do is to cry out like King David when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan, when he sinned against God, he says, I have sinned against God. 
2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. That's the five words that we refuse to say. What we find all kinds of ways to try to eliminate, erase sin from our vocabulary, from our memories, from our lives. And I wonder whether you are one of those. If you are, the good news is we can confess our sins before God. And forgiveness of sins will be given by our Lord Jesus Christ through the works of His redemption on the cross. And our guilty conscience will be cleared and peace will be restored. You know, King David, after he reflected on his sinful behavior that happened in the, second, in the 12, chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, in Psalm 51, he reflected on, on that in on verse 3, says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. It just refused to go away. You can cancel it. You can eliminate that. You can cut it from the vocabulary. You can erase it and, 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 and just black out from uh, uh, history and, and records and things like that. But it is in you. It is in your psychic. And we all know that. And you just have to deal with that. So, so King David was reflecting, you know, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. It refused to leave me. I have to deal with that. But after he confessed, in verse 12, in the same Psalm 51 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Uphold me by giving me a willing spirit to confess and to repent and to seek reconciliation with God. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And secondly, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Verses 32 and 33. And John bore witness again, the second time, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. It remained in Jesus. This is a symbolic descent of the Holy Spirit as a dove that remained on Jesus. John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Messiah who were baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, this is the messianic anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit authenticates the mission of Jesus as the Savior of the world. And the descent of the Holy Spirit and the voice from heaven identified Jesus as the Messiah. He will baptize those who believe with the Holy Spirit as a seal and guarantee of our inheritance in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus Christ baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That's his second identity. And thirdly, Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 34, he testified again, For I have sinned and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is as clear as saying Jesus is God. This is a title given to Jesus at his baptism by the Father that says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And that's when John the Baptist recognized that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Son of God testified to Jesus' deity that he is God. And this verse is the climax of John the Baptist's testimony concerning Jesus as the Messiah. He is the Son of God. That's the climax. Again, why? Why three identities and testify to his three identities? As the Lamb of God, as the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, and as the Son of God. Because his whole purpose is to point us to Jesus so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. And I wonder if you haven't met Jesus, haven't heard of Jesus, and haven't received Jesus in your life before, that after you heard the testimony that John the Baptist presented to you, would you open your hearts to receive Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for the privilege to be children 
of God. And you can do it right now, right at this moment. Just pray to Jesus, ask for the forgiveness of sins, and be reconciled with the Father and walk with Jesus as his disciples. So today, I just want to remind you and me that as much as John the Baptist is called to be witnesses, to be a witness of Jesus, we as his people, we are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ so that others may have life in Jesus and have it more abundantly. As I close this message, I want to remind you that the Messiah syndrome is real. That the temptation, the desire to be a Messiah-like figure is very strong. And remember, there's only one Messiah, and Jesus is His name. We are only witnesses. Remember our identity. We are witnesses, and only Jesus is the Messiah. We can't solve all the problems. We can rescue the world. Only Jesus can. But that lure of wanting to be able to, on top of things and solve problems, can be pretty strong, and, and it can show in the way we create superheroes. We see a lot of injustice, abuse of power and violence and unfair treatments, and there's nothing you can do about that. We build legal system and security forces, but they work outside of those systems and they can get away with things that all the system we created can't hold them accountable. And we get so frustrated. So maybe that's why we create superheroes like Superman, you know, and Spider-Man. They help us to solve all these problems problems outside the system, or the cat woman, or Shang-Chi, <laughs> and the Legend of the Ten Rings, spinning here. And if you don't hear my sermon and don't pay attention, I'll send it to you. No, no, no. <laughs> we create superheroes because deep in our heart, there is a desire for justice, and when the legal system and when the security force can help us, we look for a Messiah-like figure like in superheroes. Those superheroes can only exist in the comics, in the movies, but deep in our hearts, there's a yearning for justice, for a Messiah. And today, I want to let you know that the, Mas the Messiah has come. The Messiah was presented by John the Baptist, and he testified about his identity, that Jesus is the Messiah of the world. Ultimately, you and I are not Messiah. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that transforms our lives, transforms our community, transforms our city, transforms our nation and the world. And the end shall come. Christ will come again. You know, there's a sign in an automobile workshop that say something pretty profound if you pay attention. The sign says, if you bring in your car before it breaks down so we can do the maintenance, the rate is $30 per hour. If you wait till it breaks down and then you bring it in, the rate is $50 an hour. And if it broke, and you try fixing it yourself, and now you bring it in, the rate will be $120 an hour. Does it make sense? Many of us try to fix the problem thinking that we are the Messiah and we can solve the problem ourselves. When actually we messed up the whole system, we messed up whatever that we were trying to deal with, until we were desperate enough to come to the, to the, to the right source and asking. And, and that mechanics has to undo all the mistakes and all the wrongs that you have done before they can put it back together again. That's why it's $120 an hour. And today, I, want, I just want to let you know that you don't have to go through that process. Just come to the Messiah. Come to Jesus. 
and all the pastors who serve in this congregation, we, we are witnesses. We point you to Jesus. We can't make you love your wife or love your husband or respect your wife or respect your husband. We can't make you become active in the church and, and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We can't make you become a Christian and be a real Christian and be serious about God. We can't do that. We don't have that capability and power. Come to Jesus. Don't wake and, and until you mess up the whole system. You know, it's a lot, it's a, a longer process to put things together back when you mess up the whole system. Just come. Come to Jesus and let Him bring you to what He intend you to be because He's your Creator. Just come to Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we just want to come to you because you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you baptize us with the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit be the seal and guarantee of our inheritance in Christ. And you are the Son of God. You are God. We come to you. We come to you for strength. We come to you for salvation. We come to you for empowerment so that we can do your will together as a church. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.